afternoon. Good afternoon and good afternoon. Hello there. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club Forum, which week after week for 71 years has brought the important people and the important and controversial issues of the day to our forum audiences in person, on the radio, and on television. I'm Nelson Weiss, President of the City Club of Cleveland. We're pleased that you can be with us. Today, I have the great pleasure of introducing to you Dr. S. Frederick Starr, the President-Designate of Oberlin College. Dr. Starr assumes the presidency of Oberlin College this coming summer. Dr. Starr obtained his undergraduate degree from Yale University, a master's degree from Cambridge University in England, and his PhD from Princeton University. Since 1979, he has been professor of history at Tulane University. From 1979 to 1982, he also was vice president for academic affairs at Tulane. From 1974 to 1979, he was founder and secretary of the Kennan Institute for Advanced Russian Studies at the Smithsonian Institution. Prior to that, he was an assistant professor of history at Princeton, and he also did substantial archaeological research in Turkey in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Since 1966, he has lived, studied, and traveled extensively and often in the Soviet Union. Dr. Starr has received many academic awards and scholarships, including being a Mellon Fellow at the Aspen Institute, receiving a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and receiving the American Philosophical Society Award. Dr. Starr has authored and edited a dozen books. One of his books, published this year, is titled Red and Hot, The Fate of Jazz in the USSR. Last year, he traveled to Russia as a member of the Louisiana Repertory Jazz Ensemble. A man of many talents, Ohio, and more particularly our greater Cleveland community, and certainly Oberlin College are most fortunate to have a man of Dr. Starr's qualifications and credentials join with us. And we at the City Club are pleased to have him here with us today to speak to us on the subject, U.S. Cultural Diplomacy, Linkage, or free trade. Dr. Starr. I'd like to speak today of problem in national security. However, not that aspect of national security that involves possible laser weapons in space, or MX, or B-1 bombers, nor that which pertains to nuclear freeze, or a, the now defunct zero option, nor even that aspect of the security issue that involves the President's um, recent proposal for an interim agreement with the USSR. The aspect of national security about which I'd like to speak doesn't involve any of these areas directly, but it involves all of them indirectly, and it seems to me decisively. I have in mind the full range of our contacts abroad, cultural, scientific, educational exchanges, exhibitions, and the like, everything outside of the formal governmental relations that link us with the rest of the world, our so-called public diplomacy. Uh, in recent years, there has been much talk, much hand-wringing, over the place of the United States in world affairs. I share this concern and there is clear evidence, it seems to me, that our voice is not accorded the same serious attention, the same respect that it was earlier. And there are many examples that could be cited. The Soviet Union's cool, even smug refusal to budge on the arms talks, as if confident that eventually we must and that we will. Or the recent meeting of non-aligned nations in India, in which the presence of 100,000 Soviet troops in one of their member nations still failed to elicit any specific condemnation of the Soviet Union in that group's resolution. Or our own allies 
only with the greatest difficulty, maintaining the basis of the alliance against internal dissent by major opposition parties in Great Britain and West Germany especially. All three examples reveal an apprehension over the United States' actions, an uncertainty, even a confusion over American motives abroad. And there are various explanations for such situations. One, which has frequently been heard from this platform, I would propose, focuses on our national leadership. Whether Republicans or Democrats, from the era of Lyndon Johnson down to the period of Ronald Reagan's presidency, the quality of presidential leadership has been assailed and identified as the villain responsible for our plight. Another line of explanation, strangely coexisting with the first, would focus on what is seen as a general and fundamental decline of America's vigor, both economic and social, from which decline our weakened position at the bargaining tables in world, and in world public opinion supposedly stems. Now, I personally find this latter greatly exaggerated way of describing the reemergence of a multipolar system in world affairs after a quite unnatural period in which world affairs were thoroughly dominated by just two nations. But that's beside the point. Let me call your attention instead to this uh, fact that the second view, the notion of America's declining social, uh, economic and social vigor, if you will, uh, which is a widely held one, assumes that we are experiencing the impact of forces that are beyond our ready control, that we are somehow helpless in the face of the situation that's weakening our position globally. I think this is wrong. I would note that America's weakened voice in the world today is accompanied by, and to some extent, even caused by certain of America's own actions over which we have considerable control. And among these, none are more important than the weakening, and now in some areas, the dismantling of our public diplomacy. Our cultural contacts, in the most varied forms, exhibitions, educational and cultural li links, scientific exchanges, and so forth, all of which together in their full diversity provide a kind of human fundament on which more formal relations are then built. The, uh, pro the weakening of our public diplomacy has occurred, it seems to me, through a process both of erosion and of surgery. The erosion takes several forms, visible in quite a number of different areas. The Fulbright Program, a program that trained literally thousands of people from abroad who are now in senior positions in, in governments around the world. Uh, many of them are occupying important positions in the world, and, and a program which has also trained thousands of Americans, given them first-hand links with other countries. This has declined by about 35% across the boards in the last 20 years. And today, in various in critical parts of the world, Western Europe notably, it's virtually uh, non-existent. American books. Certainly, the knowledge explosion in this country is, is one of the important points of America's position in the world. And yet, American books are terribly expensive abroad. In most countries, accessible principally through our system of libraries that the government set up through the United States Information Agency, these libraries, these reading rooms around the world uh, have been cut back to the point that today there are half as many of them as there were 20 years ago. The number of books in them has gone down much further than that. The hours that they're open uh, has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. As a result, the attendance at these various libraries around the world, at which the full array, array of American publishing, whether literary or scientific or whatever, is available, 
the attendance is down seven-eighths. Or, to take another example, exhibitions abroad. Exhibitions of the most diverse sort, um, farm machinery, let's say. Uh, exhibitions at which the subject of the exhibit is just one point. The, you have at such exhibitions guides who are speaking to tens of thousands of people in your host country. Uh, the number of these exhibitions has plummeted, and it's plummeted under both Republican and Democratic administrations. Or to take another example of this erosion pro process of erosion, the uh, government has over the decades contributed money to enable American scholars, scientists, people in diverse fields to participate in international conferences in their areas. So if there's a Congress of Psychiatrists in Varna, let's say, or of, of physiologists in Tokyo, it will help make it possible that there will be strong American representation at those gatherings. Again, this has been dramatically cut back and systematically over quite a number of years. Or to take another one, uh, a final example, international visitors program. You're all familiar with this. You've had contact with these people. Many in prominent positions of leadership in countries abroad are brought here by our government, are given tours of the country. They are brought to major cities. They are introduced to local leaders, representative citizens. They get a taste of American life, have contact with those people responsible for the area in which they work in their own government, in their own societies. Uh, the U.S. Participants Program has, has been, again, allowed to erode and erode steadily over many years. The visitors are fewer, far fewer in number than ever before. They are coming at lower levels. There is less money available to take care of them for their care and feeding ones here, and uh, they spend far shorter time in the United States than formerly. It's evidence of the contempt we show for this exercise that the people who take them around have been, until quite recently, paid it barely over uh, $100 uh, a day, and they must take their food expenses out of that. Trivial but revealing. Now, all of this uh, is reflected in any major city in the country. In Cleveland, for example, the, which has had the first local program to foster the international visitor system, and, uh, the first local program in the country, a, a city which has won um, an award from the Institute of International Education, for the uh, work of the Council on World Affairs in this area, uh, have, even Cleveland has experienced a 20% reduction in those visitors coming. They're coming for shorter periods. They're at lower levels than before. Now, why all this has occurred? Well, it's partly the, uh, the result of the erosion of the position of the dollar. You don't have to change the budget. Just leave it as it is, and you reduce the program. Uh, and it's also uh, by... Uh, just neglect. Simply, no one has been tending the shop. Beyond the erosion of, this, of these programs, there is an important issue of outright surgery. To its credit, the Reagan administration has proposed to reactivate some of these programs in Western Europe. At the same time, however, it's proposed to virtually to abandon the U.S. Office of Education's activities in this area, uh, really to break up the office, to uh, gut the budget entirely the next time. All of this occurs, whether through erosion or surgery, at what seems to me is a terrible cost. It means that we don't have the links, the ties with people abroad. We don't build up the personal contacts. We don't have in the next generation of people abroad, of leaders abroad, those who will have a feel for American life, for the way we do things, people who, in other words, will be able to read through caricatures and to deal with this country as it is. And of course, we deny ourselves the same contacts in the other way. We are left, in other words, through this erosion, through this surgery of our public diplomacy, we are left with a generation of upcoming leaders abroad who are going to be more prone than their predecessors were to deal with the United States through caricatures. There 
is been no such decline in the public diplomacy of Western European nations. There has been no such decline in public diplomacy of Japan. And need I tell you, there has been no such decline, far from it, in the public diplomacy of the Soviet Union, which has dramatically increased its activities in all these areas over exactly the same period of time. Stated differently, we have followed, it seems to me, for a generation now, under both Republican and Democratic administrations, a course of cultural isolationism and are now frustrated at having to pay for the, its consequences. Well, can we afford to do more? The price is minimal. The entire program, the series of programs that I've been describing, is maintained by the USIA at about $100 million a year. We could increase that without bankrupting ourselves. Now, so far, I've been speaking on a point on which there is, a, I think, an emerging consensus that more should be done. Let me turn now to another aspect of the problem, more controversial. I've suggested that the decline in public diplomacy has been due to erosion, neglect, and short-sightedness. But there is another factor that's cut into it badly, and that is the imposition of sanctions, of official boycotts, of cultural embargoes, imposed in response to behavior by foreign governments whether that behavior might be aggressive acts against other nations or repressive acts against their own populace, in other words, violations in the human rights area. One can cite many examples from every region of the world where foreign governments have either been acting aggressively toward their neighbors or toward their own populace, and to which we have responded by reducing or cutting out entirely our public diplomacy. And let me focus, though, just on one country, uh, the Soviet Union. There, after Afghanistan, although we did maintain our formal academic exchanges at a slightly reduced level, uh, nonetheless, we have dropped out most of the scientific exchanges. And in many bilateral areas where we had important undertakings underway, urban affairs, health, energy, geology, weather, the most diverse areas, these have been cut out entirely. And uh, the parliamentary, interparliamentary exchange that took top officials from their country and our Congress back and forth and put them in direct touch with each other on an annual basis has been in abeyance. Performing arts uh, has been uh, suspended virtually, uh, the official exchanges. Exhibitions have been suspended. Films, they aren't seeing American films these days. What in Alan, heaven's name, this serves our interest, I don't know. Uh, even, even mutual examinations of curricula uh, in schools, which were underway and were producing some very interesting results, uh, uh, have all been suspended. After, Afghan after Afghanistan, in other words, we lifted most of our cultural contacts with the Soviet Union. After the Polish crisis, we removed what was left. And other countries have had the same experience. Uh, we did the same with regard to Poland. In Czechoslovakia, we did it in 1968 after the Soviet invasion. And, and we have now been, uh, since 1968, with virtually no cultural contact with Czechoslovakia. Now, my purpose here is not to question the validity of our motives. Soviet behavior in each instance has amply deserved what's happened. Uh, and that behavior is both on their international front and on their domestic affairs. It's led us to an under understandable desire to punish them, discipline Soviet power, an understandable desire not to extend the mantle of legitimacy to the Soviet government at a time when it's engaging in such acts. Uh, it has led us, in other words, to desire not to engage in some kind of appeasement, not to, to imply that it is possible to conduct business as usual. Now, from just such laudable motives as these comes a policy of linkage in the cultural sphere and in our public diplomacy that, it seems to me, is causing a good deal of trouble. Sometimes this is terribly effective. I think of Representative Pease's 
for mobile and sport heroically. Uh, and with regard to the suspension of American imports of coffee from Uganda, which led to the, directly to the fall of the Amin there. Uh, but it's been overused in virtually every area, linkage. Uh, as many examples of, uh, that one can find of successfully imposed boycotts, uh, one can list many, many others that have backfired in which we have, to put it bluntly, shot ourselves in the foot. The costs to the United States of all this are considerable, specifically with regard to the Soviet Union. Strange as it may seem, this country remains today, 1983, the one model of a country abroad that the Soviets take seriously. We, any educated Russian will say, the experience of the United States has more to offer us than the experience of any other country. We have developed there over a generation a large number of people who have devoted their lives to the study of this country and whose relationship to it, I leave aside such enigmatic figures as Mr. Arbata, but whose relationship to the United States is one of very deep affection and profound admiration. We have cut people, these people off. We have denied ourselves point of, points of access to their society, a closed society, a society that one can't just walk into. We have denied ourselves the, among the most useful points of access that we have. We have denied ourselves channels of two-way communication at a time when such communication was really desperately necessary. I think of the case of, of Mr. Slav Rostropovich, who happened to have been in England, in London, on a cultural exchange, giving a concert the day after the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. He walked out on the stage and played the Dvorak cello concerto. There couldn't have been a more eloquent statement. What had the British cut off that exchange that afternoon? Or, to give an example in the other direction, I think of the, literally, the case of the young American from Illinois who was a, a, a guide at the exhibition of American farm products in the Soviet Union a couple of years ago, watching this woman, fluent Russian, surrounded by a group of 40, 40 uh, Soviet farmers. This was right on the eve of Afghanistan. Uh, that conversation extended on and on in great intensity, and at the end of it, one of them came up and kissed her. It was a moving moment. We have denied ourselves such points of, of contact. For worse, though, worse is that by doing this, we have elicited a chauvinistic reaction in the Soviet Union. We have, we have in other words, no, it's not, it has hurt the people we like to have contact with, and it has not harmed those people who are responsible for the policies that we object, rightly object to. It has produced a deep chauvinistic reaction, which is exactly what we're up against in these arms talks. So it's affecting, in other words, the very basis of Soviet behavior. Well, should we then carry on merrily in the face of whatever the Russians do? Is that what I'm proposing? No. There are going to be difficult decisions. There are ambiguous situations. The Moscow Book Fair in 1977, uh, uh, American participants appeared for the first time. Uh, there was strong pressure for them to pull out. Uh, a president of a major firm was denied a visa to appear at the fair. There were 36 titles of American books removed from exhibition at that fair should we pull out in the face of such provocation? Well, we didn't in this case. 13,000 titles were exhibited. A pamphlet entitled America Through American Eyes was distributed in 100,000 copies. There was held by a group of publishers a dinner, a banquet, at which many of their most outspokenly independent writers appeared. Had we pulled out all of that, would, have been, would not have happened. On the other hand, that was a complicated, tough decision. And there will be times when we shouldn't carry on merrily, when we probably should close down operations. So it's, I don't mean to make it sound simple, do or simple don't. 
just that we balance, put the balance too far in the other direction. And there's support from surprising places for the policy I'm recommending. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who's no friend of, of uh, jolly, uh, comradely ties with the Soviet Union, uh, wrote in the spring 1980 edition of Foreign Affairs, said, I never proposed any kind of total isolationism for the USSR involving cultural and economic withdrawal. There are limits, however, and there are very specific limits to our having a policy of free trade in cultural contacts. One is if the safety of American participants is uh, threatened. Second is if the other side is blatantly exploiting that tie for, it, for their own propaganda, propagandistic purposes. Or, in the case of uh, recently, in several cases, psychiatrists and mathematicians have independently refused to participate, which should be their complete right, of course. But the channel should remain open, even if individuals or groups decide that they don't want to participate. None of this will work wonders. Uh, we do have very few coercive options that we can employ vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. On the other hand, the Soviet Union has very few coercive options that it can employ vis-a-vis -vis us. And they are acutely aware of it, which is why, exactly why, they've engaged so actively and so successfully in propaganda and cultural diplomacy. But we aren't helpless to influence them. We aren't if we follow a steady and reasonable and bipartisan foreign policy and emphasize steady. Uh, we, have, we aren't helpless if we adopt a sober and persistent defense policy rather than one of fits and starts and jerks and twists. And we aren't helpless, particularly, if we exploit the total impact of our society on theirs. Not merely through propaganda, but simply by uh, being, by communicating effectively at every level from the Voice of America uh, through the visits of musical and artistic groups and everything in between, what we are up to here. Let me conclude, if I may, with a, another line from Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Uh, he quoted a Russian proverb. He said that one word of truth weighs more than the entire world. And there is a lesson, it seems to me, in this and there's a lesson that we should heed and that we should apply to our cultural diplomacy. Thank you, Dr. Starr. Today at the City Club, we're listening to Dr. S. Frederick Starr, President-designate of Oberlin College discussing our cultural, cultural relations with Russia. In just a moment, we'll turn to our traditional question period, but first, just a very few announcements. We want to thank all of our friends of the City Club who have visited us in recent weeks since we've moved into our new quarters here in the Citizens Building. Many of you now have become official members and others are considering joining. And we've had a steady, steady increase in membership over these past weeks and months. This is just a reminder to all of you that everyone is welcome at the City Club. We are a quasi-public institution. We are completely non-exclusive. We welcome the support and participation of everyone. Please give us a call at 621-0082 for information about membership. Now is a very good time to join. We have a lot of special pro pro forums and programs that are coming up. Today we do not have students with us, as we usually do because of the school holiday. They'll be back two weeks from today. Meanwhile, we want to announce again our next seminar series. This one is a five-part program titled Transmitting Cleveland's Image. Registrations are limited, but there are still a few places left, so we hope you'll sign up today for this series that begins Tuesday, April 12, at noon, and continues on consecutive Tuesdays through the middle of May, transmitting Cleveland's image. 
Next week, our speaker will be Thomas Devine of Washington, D.C., an attorney. He is the nationally recognized watchdog on the safety of nuclear power stations. His topic will be, Who Decides How Safe is Safe? Making the Nuclear Regulatory Project Accountable to the Public. Be sure to make your reservations early for this very important address. And now we come to our questions for Dr. Starr. Two microphones as usual, one at the front with Alan Davis and one in the rear with Robert Conrad. We'll start, Dr. Starr, with this question. I am sure that uh, what you've told us here today is known to the present administration. If he chooses to disregard the benefits of keeping open the courses of contact so that each can understand the other, what are his reasons for so doing, if you know? Well, I know more understand the reasons for which President Reagan has permitted these points of contact to be closed than I understood the reasons for which President Carter did. I think in each case, though, they probably want to do something to show their disapproval. They can't find anything more effective to do and therefore can, can close down cultural contact and communication and throw about that. Dr. Starr, I'm interested in what musical instrument you play, but my question, <laughs> as, a, as a member of the Cleveland Council on American-Soviet Friendship, I have occasion to talk with the visiting Soviet citizens from time to time, and um, I can, I'm quite pointed about the suppression of, uh, of religious uh, freedom, of uh, cultural freedom or artistic freedom in their country, and they, they seem to deal with these questions uh, fairly comfortably. Uh, their answers seem rational. They, uh, uh, they explain that their system of government is different. And um, so I, I, my question really is, uh, if in your opinion with your travels, whether these exchanges are credible from my point of view. Uh, they seem to be. Uh, I read them as sincere individuals, as uh, warm people, and I don't have any real feeling of being manipulated. What is your opinion? Well, I'm not able to comment on your exchanges. The con exchanges that I have observed, however, uh, often produce uh, uh, people here uh, visiting this country from the Soviet Union who, who respond correctly and mechanically with whatever the current line is on a particular point. And then a few years later, I'm over there visiting, and I learned that so-and-so, when he got back, uh, made some quite astonishing statements in a report that he gave within his institute. It's very hard to judge the impact. I think, though, that we simply have to have faith in the fact that a Soviet citizen exposed to life in this country uh, will be able to read beyond the billboards and, and, and get some sense of what we're about. And the evidence over the years for such impact is, is, is considerable. <laughs> Dr. Starr, I'm impressed with the uh, similarity of some of your points about the information agencies. There was an article in the New York Times several weeks ago by, I believe it was the former guy Richard Gardner. Gardner. Yes. yes. Uh, would there not be some program, perhaps as a stopgap measure or a startup, for the many brilliant uh, people who have reached retirement age, uh, professors emeritus, language specialists, uh, corporation presidents, librarians, uh, to fill some sort of a, a, a gap as a volunteer basis so that it wouldn't cost so much uh, to get this thing started up again? Well, these are the types of exchanges that I'm referring to are unfortunately in most cases created through bilateral agreements of governments. The, the tough problem that we have yet to sort out in this, pro in this country, in which I don't think, for, although that's a wonderful piece that Ambassador Gardner wrote, I don't think he addressed this issue adequately, is what do you do when you trade with a state trading nation? Do you become a state trading nation? I'm not keen to have the U.S. government 
brokering all our cultural ties with the rest of the world. So when we start opening these contacts again, not just with the Soviet Union, but with many other countries, it seems to me it would be essential to devolve as much initiative in this upon independent groups, professional associations, local societies, and so forth as possible. If that were to happen, then one could imagine the kind of involvement you're speaking of developing. It's hard to conceive that happening from the rather bureaucratic way that we have often conducted these uh, um, relations in the past. In the area of linkage, would uh, you evaluate the Jackson-Bannock Amendment was it detrimental or beneficial for the United States vis-a-vis -vis USSR? Well, I should perhaps just cite the, the Jackson-Bannock Amendment, by the way. You recall was an amendment to the Trade Act that, that, that made the opening of trade and extension of, of uh, most favored nation status to the Soviet Union contingent upon their attaining a satisfactory level of free emigration for Soviet Jews. Since both Mr. Jackson and Mr. Vanek have uh, withdrawn their support for the act, I let that speak for itself. Dr. Starr, uh, can you tell us why you uh, believe that our distinguished former ambassador, Kennan, who was the author of the containment uh, doctrine for a Soviet Union, turned what appeared to be 180 degrees to being one of the most articulate opponents of the Reagan-Weinberger aggressive uh, so-called defense program? Well, I would not dare to speak for Ambassador Kennan, a man whom I have the deepest personal regard and affection for. I suspect he would deny turning 180 degrees, as you say, uh, would uh, assure you that what he understood by the policy of containment in that 1947 foreign policy article is quite different from what many of us retrospectively think it was, and that that policy as he intended it is not much different than what he's pursuing today. I suggest you take the details of that up with him, though. Dr. Starr, I'd like to ask two short questions. Um, <coughs> this uh, exchange which you recommend, uh, wouldn't this tend to be a thaw to the Cold War? And if there's no Cold War, is there any justification for the arms race? My second uh, question is, uh, as a uh, serious scholar of the so Soviet Union, uh, in your opinion, does the arms race serve any useful purpose in the Soviet Union? Well. On the first point, I don't think that our relations with that country are ever going to be either or. A ballerina has to be able to gain the skill of having great tension in one part of the body and great relaxation in another part. And if you can't do that, I gather from my life, you can't expect to be a very good ballerina. Exactly the same skill is required. We are going to have to be in, maintain a perfectly sound and, and, and solid defense policy. If that does, it has, leads one to think that the problems that we're addressing today are not going to go away, if there's no thaw that's going to replace a defense policy. On the other hand, it does seem to me that it can create a climate in which the serious long-term negotiations can occur. And what's been so unfortunate in the last last three years, last four years, is the inability to conduct uh, the kind of, of serious negotiations that would lead to practical results. Now, as to uh, whether there are internal forces within the Soviet Union uh, that benefit from an arms race, of course there are. And these are represented First of all, by uh, Mr. Ustino and the entire defense establishment, the military does constitute far the most e efficient sector of their economy. To reduce it is to reduce an area of efficiency and transfer people to an area of inefficiency. 
Um, of course, there are reasons for it, internal reasons for it, and there are many that go beyond that. There are reasons of an ideological nature and so forth. Uh, we don't yet know, I don't think anyone in this country or many people in the Soviet Union would claim to know whether those who speak for such interests have increased or decreased their voice within the Soviet government with the rise of Andropa. I don't think that's clear yet. Uh, Dr. Starr, I'd appreciate uh, your comments on whether or not the Russians' attitude towards the jazz, which to a large extent is peculiarly American, and is there any local jazz movement within the Soviet Union? Well, this is a change of topic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the answer is uh, yes, they recognize it as American in origin, but in the same way that we recognize the waltz as Viennese in origin. Uh, second, is there jazz in the Soviet Union? Indeed there is, and very, very good. And, uh, and if you have any doubts about the impact of the United States on the Soviet Union, you should have seen the, the just overwhelming response, not just from musicianship, but from the public generally, to the visit of this mayor on Stroza uh, a month ago. If I may turn back to the other side of this topic, it is interesting that both the deep-dyed hawk and the purest dove agree nowadays that we have no influence on the Soviet Union. Of course, we have no influence on the Soviet Union. I don't think that's quite true. And what I've been saying here today is without manipulating that too overtly, we can capitalize. They are not about to have the total impact on our society that we do, not only on them, but on the rest of the world. And we have not recognized it. The impact of American life is the, in the 20th century is the single strongest cultural force in the world. And we have simply not acknowledged that. Uh, we haven't reaped the benefits of it. We've reaped a lot of the problems witnessed the late French culture minister Jack Lang's conference in Paris. We've gotten the problems, but we haven't had many of the benefits. Uh, Dr. Starr, I've often heard people say that they, the Soviet or the Russians suffer a siege mentality, a sort of national paranoia. The reason I ask this, most Americans that I've talked to over the last 30 years are completely unaware that from 1918 to 1922, the U.S., the British, the French, and the Japanese had troops in Russia and taking an active part supporting the White Army. Uh, the historian Tenen says when uh, Hitler took the Rhineland and then Austria and Czechoslovakia, Stalin interpreted the West as pointing Hitler towards Russia and signed the Non-Aggression Pact. And finally, what we're doing in China today, certainly if Russia had the siege mentality, I would have to say we've contributed to it. Would you comment? Well, I, I, would, not ag I would not deny that they have a siege mentality wasn't created during their civil war after the revolution, but appeared first in history back in the 16th century or maybe 15th century when they were worried about those Catholic Poles uh, making incursions on their orthodox land. Uh, paranoia is a very loose term in the field of psychology, psychiatry. I've not found an adequate definition for it. Uh, I think though that uh, it is not fair for the United States to take responsibility for it. The intervention after World War I was not to prevent the revolution. The re intervention was to keep an ally in the war against, against uh, Imperial Germany. And, and we got out very quickly. I think they have used that as massive evidence of, of why we are paranoid and should be. Now, on the question, serious question, what does this lead to? Um, if I can use that word paranoia, loose as it is, uh, it's astonishing that what begins as defensiveness, how easily it transforms itself into an aggression, aggressive posture. The Hitler-Stalin pact was a very serious agreement, and it led directly to the invasion from two sides of Poland in the obliteration of the three Baltic states. No Soviet specialist would claim 
that this was done for any reason other than defensive. We had to protect ourselves. Well, if that's what if that's what is a defense, then uh, your defense, uh, your security is gained only only at the price of the total insecurity of all your neighbors. And this is a problem we have to deal with. The Soviet Union has expanded, largely uh, justified each point of expansion through de defensive uh, arguments of defense. Uh, how does one address that problem of cult paranoia, such as it is? I think uh, in the long run we're dealing with something deeply rooted in the culture. I think on the other hand that it is clear that the way we have been going about things, cutting off contacts, not getting this direct relationship with people is a guarantee that we'll strengthen it, that we'll perpetuate it. I'm going to make one more comment on this. I think back to the beginning of the Carter presidency, where we sent over, and out of the fullness of our hearts, the, the Secretary of State, National Security Advisor, and so forth, with a brand new proposal, the dramatic new start in the negotiations. They got off the plane in Moscow, announced it to the press, and said, we're going to present this to the Russians. Went in, it shook, them, it shook hands, introduced themselves for the first time, and the Russians made it very clear that it, it's normal to meet the people you're going to negotiate with first, maybe drink a bottle of wine with them, get to know one another, and then begin to discuss your negotiating position, and not to announce it at the airport when you arrive. That process, which seems so innocent to us, Certainly, it heightened the sense of, of paranoia, unquestionably. We can avoid that sort of thing without denying our own interests. How can we have meetings, international meetings, when this administration says, you know, anything can be uh, violate our national security? And also, I would like to take an issue with one point that you made, which is, there's no difference between the Carter and Reagan administration. The Carter administration allowed these meetings to go on, and the Reagan administration stops them. Well, I have to disagree with you. The Carter administration cut off, cut off many of the contacts with the Soviet Union. Uh, after that famous kiss in Vienna, <laughs> things went very quickly downhill. Uh, once the president was unable to carry Congress on salt, we were, we were, we were on the warpath. Um, so, I, I think, I think we're talking about something that both Republicans and Democrats have engaged in, and I think to our, uh, not to our interest. Uh, doctor, currently I uh, was in the Soviet Union. I noticed a lot of students uh, visiting in what looked like subsidized groups uh, by the Soviet Union. And it struck me that uh, the new administration might consider these particular inroads as more of a virus that would destroy the, uh, the sanctity of the Soviet Union and the policies. And I recognize that the major changes in Soviet history came from the outside, German Tsarinas and uh, Lithuanian Catholics. Um, do you uh, think the public policy should be amended when we do send people over there to have a, uh, a more uh, uh, focalized kind of attack uh, in particular, vis-a-vis -vis the current debates, which were on the uh, uh, Channel 25 recently here in Cleveland, where the debaters seem not to have a very strong basic view. It's more uh, open, open-ended kind of talk. Do you think that perhaps our public policy, vis-a-vis -vis the um, public information agencies or the government, should be focalized to that point? If I understand you correctly, yes. Uh, the um, Unintended con consequences there of contact are fascinating. In 1957, a long time ago, they held something called the World Youth Festival in Moscow. And it was, if you, any of you recall that far off day, it was depicted as a most sinister gathering. And I'm sure its organizers hoped it would be just that. And John Foster Bellis, uh, in his wisdom, um, urged quite strongly, American youth not to participate in this nefarious scheme. Well, uh, quite a few did, and tens of thousands went from all over Western Europe. The long-term impact of that was to green a whole generation of Soviet youth. 
It had no impact on the people who came from abroad, really. But suddenly, suddenly the hippie movement began in the Soviet Union. It was really a life of a generation was transformed by these people who were invited there to sing the praises of, of, of the Soviet system. Well, Dr. Starr, I've read that um, Russia, the, um, you know, the scholars there, uh, are so interested in the United States they could even pinpoint uh, the changing population of Dubuque, Iowa from one year to another. But on the other hand, we've lost that uh, curiosity. And uh, this is on an academic level. I don't mean the uh, exchange level. Uh, there are fewer Russian scholars in our universities, fewer departments, fewer money spent. Um, do you find that true? And if so, is Oberlin um, trying to train uh, people who are interested in Russia and really have a, uh, you know, in a, from a very intellectual level and, and uh, going into knowing about the country and its culture? Well, we've done a dreadful job of, of studying the rest of the world, not just the Soviet Union. The uh, well-known statistic now that there are more students of uh, there are more teachers of English in the Soviet Union than there are students of Russian in the United States is certainly true. And, and I, um, the study of rigorous study of the Soviet Union is, is well rooted here. There are some really very, very capable people. Uh, we don't have many posts for them to function in, and I don't think the best of them, are, uh, their, their voices are much heard these days. On the other hand, they have done a super job in the last 20 years of building up American studies. Uh, I don't know about Dubuque, but uh, I did read a very interesting description of Cleveland in a recent uh, Soviet publication someone had here a while ago. In general, uh, we can do a lot more on that, but this is part of a broader problem of the virtual abandonment of foreign language study in the United States and of and it's serious, interna rigorous international studies. Regarding Oberlin, I'm pleased to say I met a student a couple of weeks ago who is uh, studying the Russian language, and, and his accent and everything is awesomely good. <laughs> Dr. Starr, how do you evaluate the exchange of religious delegations between the countries? Is this... Uh, from the Russian point of view, just another cultural exchange, or do they have a special agenda in this area? We know that the dissident groups in the, neither country are exposed to the other, and is this different than with the out-of-step cultural groups, or is this also a special phenomenon? Well, there's, it's clear that many of their religious delegations that have come here have come with various charges laid upon them by their government. It's also clear that in spite of that, uh, there have been some genuine and important contacts that result from that, just as there have been value, there has been value from our various religious leaders who've gone there. I'm not about to speak about Billy Graham's trip, which is more problematical. I'd like to add one point about the nature of these agreements, because I don't want it I don't want to leave any confusion about the fact that we are talking about government-to-government -government agreements. It's not just that suddenly we decide in our hearts that co cultural contact is a good thing. It's much more complicated because their position right now is if you want cultural contact, then let's come to some arms agreement. Now, that's, that's, that's where the catch-22 is, but let me say, on exactly that point, there is ground, there always has been ground for, for movement that we haven't exploded. Dr. Starr, I have two questions. The first one is that uh, you uh, have expertise in three areas, ancient history, Sovietology, and uh, you're a jazz clarinetist. My uh, a question for that is how are you able to uh, master three areas that are so diverse in such an, uh, an excellent way? And secondly, what is the course of Soviet hegemony? Um, let's, well, that's a, a very large topic. Let's say in Asia. Well, I, I will end this with a brief selection on the clarinet, which was, <laughs> which, was <laughs> which will discredit your question. <laughs> On the question of the Soviet Union in Asia, 
there has always been a tension in their foreign policy, and it dates back to Zara's days, between their Europeanists and their Asianists. Uh, my own view is that the Asianists have generally been the, the, the tougher, the less sophisticated, the harder nosed, and the Europeanists tend to have been more uh, people of broader cultural horizons, more sophisticated folk. And I feared at the time of Afghanistan, and I still fear it, that the Asianists in their military and foreign policy establishment are getting the upper hand and that they're as tough as they were 100 years ago when they took Central Asia. Uh, I watch now this dramatic shift of attention simultaneously toward Europe, and I'm not sure who has the upper hand at this point. Uh, it's an interesting thing to speculate. But uh, I think that every day that the Afghanistan situation continues, in which, incidentally, I think we should exploit up to the hilt in our choice of America and every information means that we have, it, makes, it, it limits their freedom of action in, in, in Western Europe. Now, let me remind you that when we were deep in, deep in Vietnam uh, and when, and when uh, our president was being Vice President Lovett was being received in, in Moscow. At that very day, we bombed ha Hanoi. And yet, because they were interested, they saw their interest in a cultural, in a arms agreement, and so they pursued it in the face of that. And that, I think, it shows that is an example of that ability to keep muscle tense in one part and relaxed in another. And that's something that we don't have at this point, and that our Political system doesn't encourage. Dr. Starr, to what extent is the USSR currently denying visas to Americans or citizens of other countries that wish to visit the Soviet Union, to your knowledge? They are denying some and letting some in, <laughs> and, and quite capriciously at times. Thank you very much. Dr. Starr, thank you very, very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Our forum is adjourned.